everyone. Welcome to our March 2022 uh, lunchbox lesson here at Scurry Crossing. And um, thank you for joining us. And let me introduce our presenter today. Kelly Yakabuchi Farquhar is the Montgomery County Historian and Records Management Officer. A native of Canada Harry, she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree from Siena College. Kelly has worked in the Montgomery County Department of History and Archives since 1996, with the appointment to the County Historian slash RMO in 2000. Her work has included the publication of two books in the Images of America series from Arcadia Publishing, Montgomery County, and Amsterdam, co-authored with Scott Hefner. Additionally, she has worked with Dr. Judith Wellman to compile the book, Uncovering the Underground Railroad, Abolitionism and African-American Life in Montgomery County, New York, 1820 to 1890. A look at Montgomery County's participation in this movement of social reform, as well as the lives of African-Americans within the county. Her and other research has explored the role of women in the county and even a way at war. She continues to research and collect the history of Montgomery County and through her office provides several programs throughout the year, such as this one. So join us in welcoming to our lunchbox lesson, Kelly Farquhar. Thank you very much. Um, this welcome. is very appropriate given that today is International Women's Day. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how Montgomery County participated in the struggle for women's rights. Two years ago in 2020, the nation celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. This amendment gave women a voice in their lives by providing them with the right to vote in elections. This was at the national level of our government. So now let's take a look at the inv involvement locally that led up to the 19th Amendment. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is one of the best known proponents of rights for women. She was born on the 12th of November, 1815 in Johnstown, which was then the county seat for Montgomery County. She was one of 10 children born to Daniel Cady and Margaret Livingston. This was the same year that Daniel Cady was elected to Congress. In his address to the Johnstown chapter of the DAR in 1933, the Honorable John T. Morrison described Johnstown as, quote, the intellectual center of central New York, attracting many and most of the distinguished men and women of the country, end quote, during the period that the Cady family resided there. He went on to say that, quote, women had few privileges at this time, little independence and few rights under the old common law. A girl might be a genius, but her legal status and rights of citizenship were such that her accomplishments counted for little compared with the opposite sex. Elizabeth Cady keenly and bitterly felt the injustice of this discrimination and resolved to do everything in her power to right this obvious wrong, end quote. And so began her quest. On July 14, 1848, she issued a call to hold the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Just five short days later, attendees convened. Ahead of the Seneca Falls Convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton used the Declaration of Independence as a sort of framework or template for compiling what became known as the Declaration of Sentiment. This declaration identified reasons why the fight for women's rights was a just cause. I'm going to outline them and uh, list those that were um, identified in the declaration. Married women were legally dead in the eyes of the law. Women were not allowed the right to vote. Women had to submit to laws when they had no voice in their formation. Married women had no property rights. That is any property they owned or inherited legally became their husband's property. Husbands had legal power over and responsibility for wives where they could do such things as imprison them or physically harm them without punishment from the law. Divorce and custody laws favored men as women had no rights in these issues. Women had to pay property taxes without representation in levying those taxes. 
Most occupations were closed to women and those occupations that they could do earned them only a fraction of the pay earned by men in those same occupations. Women were not allowed to enter legal or medical professions at that time. Women had no means for education since colleges and universities did not admit them. With only a few exceptions, women were not allowed to participate in church affairs. Stanton's contributions to the plight of women's suffrage included extensive travel, giving lectures across the nation, appearing before Congress and state legislatures. She traveled abroad to appeal on the rights of women. She wrote many articles that were published in newspapers, magazines, and pamphlets, as well as a three-volume work on the history of women's suffrage. Stanton said, quote, we have furnished the bricks and mortar for some future architect to rear a beautiful edifice, end quote. Susan B. Anthony, she was a temperance lecturer, abolitionist, and women's rights activist, and she would become one of the best known women in U.S. history. In 1846, she accepted a teaching position at Canajoharie Academy. Her years in Canajoharie represent a period of consolidation and growth just before she became active in public life. In Canajoharie, she developed a sense of herself as an independent person and a budding reformer in the context of a loving extended family. As headmistress of the female department, Susan B. Anthony taught from 1846 to 1849 in the building that stood on this spot. One cousin called her, quote, the smartest woman in Canada, Harry. Here she began her public career as a reformer when she gave her first lecture on temperance on March 2nd, 1849. She resigned her position in 1849 to move to Rochester, where she lived with her parents and began her career in abolitionism and women's rights. During her time in Canada, Harry, Susan stayed with cousins, George and Eleanor Reed Caldwell, and Joseph and Margaret Reed Caldwell. Margaret was pregnant with her last child, so Susan helped her with household duties and caring for her young children. Anthony's reluctance for marriage may have developed in Canada, Harry, as a result of Joseph Caldwell's self-centered attitudes. She wrote her mother of an incident when during Margaret's difficult pregnancy, Joseph complained of a headache. After Margaret indicated that she'd had one for weeks, he countered that his was, quote, a real headache, genuine pain. Yours is of a natural consequence, end quote. Susan was devastated when Margaret died a few weeks later. It was also during her tenure at Canada Harry that Anthony realized the inequity of pay for female teachers was only one quarter that of her male counterparts. While men received $10 per month, women only received a $2.50 a monthly stipend. A quote from her first public speech in 1853 at the New York Educational Convention says, quote, do you not that as long as society says that a woman has not brains enough to be a lawyer or doctor or minister, but has ample brains to be a teacher, that every man of you who condescends to teach acknowledges before all Israel and the son that he hasn't any more brains than a woman, end quote. Susan B. Anthony was introduced to Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1851, the beginning of a lifelong friendship and a compatriot in the struggle for women's rights. In June 1867, New York State held a constitutional convention. In late 1866 and the spring of 1867, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony organized lecture tours across New York State, promoting universal voting rights in the new Constitution, including suffrage for African American men and women, as well as all ethnic backgrounds. On March 25, 1867, both Stanton and Anthony spoke at Devendorf Hall in Fort Plains on the subject of universal suffrage. To recognize Susan B. Anthony for her achievements, she was honored with a postage stamp, a United States postage stamp in 1936, and a coin in 1975. And you can see those on the slide. 
While the movement for women's rights gained momentum after the Seneca Falls Convention, leaders disagreed on the strategy and tactics for achieving their goals. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony organized the National Woman Suffrage Association, or the NWSA, where they directed their efforts towards changing federal law. Another faction of women's rights supporters, led by Massachusetts anti-slavery advocate Lucy Stone, applied their strength to the state level for advancing women's rights. This group, the American Woman Suffrage Association, or the AWSA, was the larger of the two groups and better funded. Despite the lack of information to be immediately found on suffrage in Montgomery County through our archival collection at the Department of History and Archives, I was able to piece together data through newspaper articles. Anna E. Dickinson lectured in Fort Plain at Devendorf Hall in November 1867 on what were considered at the time to be extremist views of women's rights. Her lecture was titled, Idiots and Women. While some attendees may have been enlightened by Ms. Dickinson's lecture, one attendee reported in the Mohawk Valley Register, December 6, 1867, that quote, while many of the charges she brings against our statute laws may be true, in this state, they are exceedingly favorable to women. We can say no remedy in or we can see no remedy in women's suffrage. Instead of elevating the morals of politics, as Miss Dickinson thinks, the chances are greater that the women would be brought down to the level of the harlots who would make merchandise of their political principles, end quote. Louisa Jacobs, daughter of Harriet Jacobs, who wrote Incidents of the Life of a Slave Girl about her experiences in slavery, spoke on women's rights also in Fort Plain during a tour with Charles Lennox Raymond. In 1880, women were allowed to vote at school meetings as long as they met certain requirements. Those requirements included that they were aged 21 or over, they were residents of the district and owned personal property valued at $50 or more, and third, that they had school-aged children within the said district residing with them. That was according to the school bulletin from October of 1880, volume number two, number 73. The Batavia Daily News reported in 1885, however, that a school vote there failed to do due to the lack of women who voted. But they did report that in Canajahari that same year, 99 women voted in a school election. So both the NWSA and the AWSA had only limited success with their efforts during the second half of the 19th century. And both groups recognized that this was due to their division between, um, between the two organizations. Ultimately, in the last decade of the 19th century, they united to form the National American Women's Suffrage Associ Association, or the NAWSA. This new organization drew support from women's activist groups, such as the Women's Trade Union, the Women's Christian Temperance League, and the National Consumers League. Women's suffrage advocates launched an educational campaign in 1894, where representatives went to all 4,892 election districts across New York State, encouraging the right of women to vote so that the impending constitutional convention would put forth an amendment for men to vote in the November election, which would therefore allow women to vote. Unfortunately, the amendment never made it to the constitutional convention, and ultimately women did not see their efforts on the ballot that November. Many local organizations, particularly those primarily composed of women, entertained speakers who lectured on the rights of women. Harriet May Mills, a prominent leader in the struggle for women's political equality, traveled all over New York State where she helped to build one of the largest suffrage organizations in the country. She visited Montgomery County a number of times. She spoke to the parliamentary school in 1902, to the St. Johnsville Study and Reading Clubs in Fort Plain on women's work at home, at home and abroad, as well as their political equality in March 1908. A year later, 
is vice president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. She spoke to Canada Jahari residents at Mohawk Hall, where she gave a lecture on the political freedom of women as part of the association's sponsored series of talks throughout the Hudson and Mohawk Valleys. She returned in January 1912 when she spoke to members of the Kanjahari's Colonial Club on the subject of women's suffrage. Harry Chapman Catt, a suffrage, a suffragist and peace activist, presided over a suffrage convention and banquet held at Amsterdam's Barnes Hotel in June 1916. The group elected three leaders from Montgomery County, one of whom was Helen Farmer of Nelliston. By the second decade of the 20th century, however, groups were forming locally, specifically with a purpose of garnering the political equality for women. In 1913, a group of women led by Mrs. Harry R. Illingworth of 41 Church Street organized the Amsterdam branch of the Women's Political Union of New York State, an organization founded by Harriet Stanton Blatch, daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The following year, a suffrage league organized in St. Johnsville with Lena Nellis, Adelaide Franklin, Mrs. Leah A. Devendorf, and Mrs. John F. Clock as officers. Another league formed in Fonda and Fultonville with Mrs. Abram D. Smith, Mrs. James I. Spraker, and Mrs. George Westcott as officers. On this slide, you'll see at the bottom um, left-hand uh, part of the slide, there is what looks to be a card and that is the a membership card for the Empire State Campaign Committee. And that is part of our collection here at the Montgomery County Department of History and Archives. This membership card belonged to Gertrude M. Baird. She was a 96 year old widow from the town of Glen. Born in October 1819, Mrs. Baird was a member of the Empire State Campaign Committee. The Empire State Camp Campaign Committee was a coalition of organizations, including the Women's Suffrage Party, the Women's Suffrage Association, the Women's Political Union, and other similar organizations headed by Carrie Chapman Catt. It was created to bring New York women together in support of the state women's suffrage am amendment. Local suffrage groups held meetings across Montgomery County in Grange Halls, churches, and theaters. The Albany Times Union reported on March 17, 1915, that the third campaign district, which consisted of Albany, Schenectady, Montgomery, and Schoharie counties, had mass meetings in Fonda, Fultonville, Kanjahari, and Palat Palatine Bridge with suffrage addresses. <clears throat> Quoting from that article, they said there is close cooperation between all these local clubs. End quote. Mrs. Allen Updegraff presented on the New York State Amendment at a March 24, 1915 meeting at the old courthouse right here in our building. <clears throat> Booths supporting suffrage were on hand also at the Montgomery County Fair. The Amsterdam Campaign Club organized April of 1915 in which members pledged to influence Montgomery County voters to support and vote in favor of the women's suffrage amendment to the New York State Constitution. The Montgomery County Women's Suffrage League formed in June of 1916. Helen S. Carmichael and Mrs. W. Barlow Dunlap, both of Amsterdam, Mrs. Elmer J. Feinhout of Canajahari, and Charlotte E. Keyes and Lulu A. Van Valkenburg both of Amsterdam, were all officers. According to an article that appeared in the Larchmont Times in September 1916, New York State Governor Whitman spoke in support of suffrage at the Montgomery County Fair that previous October. He was joined by the chairman of the County Republican Committee and fair officials who, quote, sat on the platform in complete suffrage regalia. End quote. 
So, since we already discussed a broad view of the suffrage movement, let me briefly mention the antithesis of suffrage. In other words, the anti suffrage movement. Given where we are in today's society, we take many things for granted, including our voice as women. While suffragists were spreading the word and gaining momentum to have a voice in politics and business, etc., there were a great many who were opposed to that. Anti suffragists fervently believed women did not have the right to vote. One would immediately think that this group who wanted to stifle women's voices consisted of men who did not want to challenge to their power and authority. Who were they? Primarily women with wealth, privilege, and social status. They wanted to maintain the system that provided them with that privilege. Northern anti-suffragists were typically daughters or wives of wealthy bankers, businessmen, or politicians. They were usually involved in philanthropic organizations that adhered to traditional gender norms. Anti-suffragists espoused the tradition of domesticity, motherhood, and femininity. In her book, No Votes for Women, the New York Anti-Suffrage Movement, Susan Goodyear makes the case that contrary to popular thought, women who opposed suffrage were not against women's rights. Instead, quote, conservative women encouraged women to retain their distinctive feminine identities as protectors of their homes and families, a role they felt was threatened by the imposition of masculine political responsibilities, end quote. The anti-suffrage movement got its start in 1871 when the Anti-16th Amendment Society sent a petition to Congress. Over 5,000 signatures were gathered denouncing the vote for women. A group comprised of Catherine Beecher, Elmira Lincoln Phelps, who was Emma Willard's sister, Mrs. William T. Sherman, Mrs. John Sherman, and Madeline Dahlgren, who was the wife of a Civil War general, led the way to prohib prohibit enfranchisement for women. Once they achieved this goal, they stepped out of the limelight. In 1897, seven, suffrage opponents organized to form the New York Association Opposed to Woman Suffrage. By 1908, there were over 90 members that produced pamphlets and literature explaining their opposition to suffrage. The Anti-Suffragist, which was the name of the publication, ran from July 1908 to April 1912 and was published by Mrs. William Winslow Crannell. Unorganized efforts for anti-suffrage began receiving support from National Brewers Association beginning in 1881, along with meat packers, railroads, and mining industries. All were convinced their profits were at risk if women had the opportunity to vote for reform legislation. Sarah Josepha Hale, who was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book, was an ardent opponent for suffrage. With her magazine, she provided a vehicle for anti-suffrage supporters. Suffragettes were depicted as wanton, misguided, ugly, and domineering. The first national organization challenging the fight for women's suffrage, the National, Oppo the national Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, was founded in 1911. Gaining strength after 1912, it allegedly had some 350,000 members that believed suffrage would reduce women's work in communities and their ability to affect societal reforms. Mrs. Henry O. Havemeyer, widow of the millionaire Sugar King, arrived in Amsterdam in June 1915 in a limousine bearing the Liberty Torch. Her lecture advocated four reasons for wanting women to vote. Political, as women have a right to opinions and a right to vote. Legal, as a woman, quote, should have a voice in making the laws by which she has to comply, end quote. Civically, as, quote, women who are property owners have to pay taxes, they have a right to know where that money goes and how it shall be spent, end quote. And nationally, as members of the United States, 
and quote, because we want to make our free and glorious country better in every way we can, end quote. An article in the New York Sun in August 1915 revealed that suffragists were having difficulty making headway in Montgomery County. I'm quoting from this article and it says, quote, suffragists here are making an active campaign and have been for a long time, especially in Canajahari, three miles east, where they are being aided by Walter H. Light, one of the richest, foremost businessmen in all this section. No anti-suffrage association exists here, but many of the prominent women are opposed to suffrage or at best disinterested. Ms. Ruth Dexter of New York is now here and addressing suffrage meetings in Village Street and in rural districts in Grange Halls. There is every reason for believing that the vote will be large. A suffrage meeting to organize a campaign committee in Fort Plain was held in the Wagner House on Main Street Wednesday afternoon. It was attended by 16 women and Ms. Helen Farmer, vice leader of Montgomery County presided. Ms. Eva S. Wap was elected town leader, after which Miss Ruth Dexter of New York gave a short talk on why the women of Fort Plain should take an active part in the movement, end quote. Mrs. Erna Von B. Owen lectured at Amsterdam that women were taking up arms and fighting side by side with their husbands in Europe in the midst of World War I. They were running the railroads Tram card, cleaning streets and working in factories, nursing the sick and making clothing for soldiers and caring for orphans. However, quote, voting seems to be the only dangerous thing we women must stay at home to avoid, end quote. The New York referendum was defeated in 1915, so Montgomery County women stepped up their game. Four local women, I've mentioned their names before, Helen Carmichael, Charlotte Keyes, Mrs. Henry McEwen, and Lula Van Valkenburg represented Montgomery County at the Atlantic City Suffrage Convention for five days in September 1916. The November 18, 1916 issue of the Amsterdam Evening Reporter noted that suffragists, including again, Helen Carmichael, and this time they mentioned Mrs. Florence S. Kellogg of Amsterdam, visited with the New York State Congressman William B. Charles of the 30th District, who would support the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. By 1917, Montgomery County had the Amsterdam Suffrage Party, led by Helen Carmichael, the Fonda Suffrage League, chaired by Mrs. George W. Westcott, the Kanjahari and Palatine Suffrage League, chaired by Mrs. Elmer J. Finout, the industrial section of the Kanjahari and Palatine Suffrage League, chaired by Mrs. Sanford Bracebridge. The Fort Plain Suffrage Party, led by Mrs. Isaac H. Baer. And the St. John, Johnsville Suffrage Party, led by Mrs. John Gammon. So that was a wide representation across all of the villages in Montgomery County. With Carrie Chapman Catt at the helm of the National American Women's Suffrage Association at the time of the United States entrance into World War I, the organization embraced the war effort, believing that women could prove themselves and that national enfranchisement would help them participate more in the war effort, particularly with duties outside of the home. As members of the New York State Women's Suffrage Party, local women took part in taking the military census asking questions of every man and woman between the ages of 16 and 50. This work was led by the suffrage league leaders. Despite the 1915 defeat for the New York State Amendment, two years later, it did pass. Ironically, women's suffrage amendment for the New York State vote on November 12, 1917, was voted down by men in Montgomery County with 3,016 men voting no. Hugh Donlin argued in his Outlines of History, Montgomery County, State of New York, 1772 to 1972, that the margin was narrow, however, as it was only defeated by 312 votes, primarily from those in the rural towns, adding, quote, 
Minden men were particularly negative. By the time New York women achieved the vote, there were 15 states who already had legislation in place. Finally, in 1920, with the certification of the 19th Amendment in August, billions more women were allowed what so many had spent their lives trying to achieve. There are so many resources on this subject. Um, you can do a Google search and, and so many different um, books have written have been written on this subject. So um, I didn't want to take the time to list them and exclude anyone. Um, but the, the subject is vast. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I said, if there are any questions, put them in the chat. I know I, I, know I didn't realize that um, Susan B. Anthony lived and taught in Andrew Harry for a number of years. Yeah, yeah, she was there from 1846 to 1849. Yeah, see, I, I don't know if you, you might have mentioned it and I didn't catch it, but what did she teach? Um, I, I don't know the specific topics that she or the subjects that she taught, but she was identified as preceptress of the female academy. Um, so basically, I think she she just presided over uh, the female students. But she, okay. while she was um, in Canada, Harry, she stayed with family. Her mother um, was a sister to Joshua Reed um, in Palatine Bridge. So. The Reeds or the Caldwells that she stayed with uh, were married to Margaret um, Margaret Reed and uh, her sister. Um, so they were all living in Canada, Harry, at the time. Um. <laughs> I have a question from Dave. Are still local descendants of the heads of those local suffrage movements? Are they involved with any of the women's consortium con consort consortium organizations now? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I I would assume. I mean, some of these names that I've mentioned are still in the area. Um, I I do believe that there is there's the Elizabeth Cady Stanton consortium uh, up in Johnstown, mm -hmm. and I know that one of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's I think it's a great granddaughter um, is involved with that group. Yeah, I know when you were um, naming some of the women, the you know you heard you know. Prominent names of the Mount Valley area uh -huh. last names and yeah, because the the industry in the um the Mount Valley kind of you don't know, realize how much impact it had on everything here, the vote and um other things in part of history. I have a question from Chris Welch. And what was the experience for women immediately after the right to vote was granted? Um, I, I think, well, I know that when the 1920, um, the 19th Amendment was granted in 1920, um, that did not immediately give all women the right to vote. Um, apparently, there were still some discriminatory restrictions against some women. Um, so while it is safe to say that millions of women gained the right to vote, not every single one 
was granted that opportunity. Um, I think the experience for women was that they still had a lot of inroads to, um, they, they still had a struggle, basically. Um, while things did change, there were still a lot of things that needed to be addressed. Well, I thought it was a great program, and I'll have to get down to the archives again and look at what um, women's suffrage uh, documents and stuff you have there at Montgomery County. Yeah, um, like I said, unfortunately, we don't have a large collection um, in our archival collection. Uh, there could be, I mean, we do have documents or collections from some women's groups that were here locally. Um, you know, the Colonial Club of Kanjahari, we have some of their collections. We have um, records from the Deborah Glenn Study Club in the town of Glenn. Um, so it really would be good if someone if wanted to research this further, they could look at those collections and and see what materials they may have in in those items um you know because we know that suffrage leaders came and spoke to these groups so um there could be programs there could be you know any any number of items it, it would it would be great you know if someone wanted to do further research yeah right exactly that sounds like a Good project to dig it on. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions um, in the chat. But again, thank you, Kelly, for doing this presentation. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate very it. Very informative. And if anybody has any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to me here at the archives. Yeah, I'll put that link up again. So, yep, thank you all for joining. Um, Kelly, it's great to talk with you, and um, I'll uh, talk with you again uh, soon. Okay, thank you. Yep. Everyone stay well. Yep, bye everyone.